Okay, so Panchatattva ki jai. Okay, so I know you're all there. Let's see. Yes. If if the wall was any farther out, you'd be. <laughs> of course, we have our technicians over there. It's actually, they're all listening to uh, another lecture, but it looks like they're listening to mine. <laughs> it looks good anyway. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's a nice colored shirt. Jai Maharaj. Okay, so we'll do the Mangala Charanam. And not the whole thing, just the general one. Om Agyan Timidandasya Gajanjana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Guruvena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swampadantikam Pande Ham Shigaro Shiyuta Padekamalam Shigarun Vaishnavamscha Sri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahaganad Raganatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitam Sha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanjana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Suri Rikabanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpa Taruvischa Kripa Sindhu Piebacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Vadaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesa Sunyavadi Pastyatyade Sitarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasati Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So, I think today is a disappearance day of two quite stalwart Vaishnavas in Lord Chaitanya's line. It's Gubarba, Gu. Bhugarbha, Bhugarbha Goswami and uh, Kashivar Pandit, Kashivara Pandit. So um, there is very little available on the life of Bhugarbha Goswami. In fact, there is no account of any of his activities. As much as we know, he is was very much intimately connected with Lokanath Das Goswami. And Lokanath Das Goswami or him, it's described that they were like two souls in one body. They were very much connected with each other in, in loving friendship and devotional service. Um, it mentions that he was Prema Manjari in Radha Leela, one of the Manjaris. Um, that's practically all we know. His Samadhi Mandir is in the Radha, um, Radha Raman temple. 
uh, along with Rupa Goswamis. And um, practically that's it. On Bhugarbha Goswami, there's no record, there's no books. Sometimes a devotee will uh, keep his activities very confidential and secret. Uh, this is also true with Lokanath Das Goswami. Also, to describe his life, all we ever do is talk about how he tried to see Lord Chaitanya, and Lord Chaitanya was always traveling. So he was always trying to catch up with Lord Chaitanya, and every time he arrived at the place where Lord Chaitanya was supposed to be, Lord Chaitanya had just left that place. <laughs> that happened about three or four times in a row. Finally, the Lord told him, just stay in Vrindavan. <laughs> Don't try to run after me. <laughs> so many nice words, he said. That's all we know about Lokanath Das Goswami except his relationship with Naratam Das Thakur as guru. So those two persons, Lokanath Das Goswami and Bhugarbha Goswami, were inter intimately connected. And in the Samadhi Mandir, Lokanath Das Goswami is in the Radha Gokulananda Temple in Vrindavan along with Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's um, uh, Samadhi Mandir. So we'll speak a little bit about Kashivara Pandit. There is something there. Um, uh, he was born in a Vaishya family. His father's name was Vasudev. And um, he became a disciple of, uh, what's his, well actually his Shashi Reka, Shashi Reka um, Gopi was his identity in uh, Krishna Leela. And uh, somehow he found shelter under the lotus feet of Ishwar Puri, who was also the spiritual master of Lord Chaitanya. And so Lord Chaitanya and Kashivara Pandit were god brothers, actually. But at one point, after Madhavendra Puri, which was the grand Param Guru of, of uh, Lord Chaitanya, and the Guru of Ishwar Puri, after he disappeared, and Lord Chaitanya he started to perform his activities in the area of Navadweep, and then later in Jagannath Puri, his spiritual master Ishwar Puri told uh, Kashivara Pandit, you go and serve Lord Chaitanya and assist him in his activities in Navadweep. He also gave the same instruction to another god-brother of Lord Chaitanya, who was, whose name was Govinda. So this was an unusual instruction because there is an injunction, a strict injunction in the scriptures that a god-brother cannot make another god-brother his personal servant. That's considered offense. Sometimes we even saw that in ISKCON when some senior god brother who was a guru somehow made their god brother a personal uh, assistant, but it is somewhat against the etiquette and is very much restricted. So when Lord Chaitanya uh, met these two persons, and they had come to assist him in his service, the Lord became very much disturbed, knowing the etiquette. So he came, he decided to inquire from Sarabhoma Bhattacharya. Of course, the Lord Chaitanya knows everything. He doesn't have to inquire. But playing the role of a perfect devotee, he went to, uh, to Sarabhoma Bhattacharya and said, this is the situation, Govinda, Prabhu Govinda Das and um, Kashivara Pandit have been given to me by my spiritual master to assist me in services. This is not right. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya immediately solved the problem. He said, yes, that is true, but the instructions of the spiritual master are higher. It's a higher principle. So Ishwara Puri's instructions was to these two god brothers to serve Lord Chaitanya. So Lord Chaitanya accepted that. 
And Govinda became his personal servant. He would take care of all the Lord's personal needs. He was very intimately connected on a day-to-day -day basis, arranging for his prasadam and his bedstead, or whatever the Lord needed on the personal level. But Kashivara Pandit had a different service. He was a big guy, pretty big, maybe the size of Alex, <laughs> maybe even bigger. Maybe he's an incarnation of Kashivara Pandit now. No. <laughs> You never know. <laughs> he was really big and he was very, very physically powerful. Is that, does that apply? No? No. Okay. Very physically powerful. And so his service was to keep uh, the devotees, or not the devotees, but people in general away from Lord Chaitanya when he would be walking. Because we know a lot of times when there's a saintly person, a guru, people want to run and talk to them, touch them, grab their lotus feet, or just ask questions. And Lord Chaitanya couldn't get anywhere, you know. We find that, uh, that happens a lot also. <laughs> you take one step and somebody's there. So at least that's in India like that. <laughs> so... Um, he had to keep the crowds away. And so with his very strong body, and using his arms, he would push back the crowds. <laughs> so he was a big guy. So you might say he was Lord Chaitanya's bodyguard, like that. So when Lord Chaitanya would go to the temple to see Lord Jagannath, then this would happen frequently. And sometimes he would organize the other devotees to help in keeping the crowds away. So one of the programs that they'd use, and we also used this in our yatras a few times when I was in India, is that devotees make circles holding hands, very tight circles, sometimes locking arms, around the person, and then there's another circle on, around that circle, and then there's a third circle. So there's three circles guarding the person, because sometimes I remember when we were in Jagannath Puri in 2006 for the Ratha Yantra. Of course, there's more than a million people there. It's, it's kind of crowded. <laughs> million plus people. More than a million. A million is like a, like a low number count. And so we were doing kirtan with Radhanath Swami Maharaj and Indra Duma Maharaj and Sri Prahlad Prabhu. And many of the stalwart kirtaniers who had also joined us from different places. I remember the temperature was 110 degrees Fahrenheit. What is that, Celsius? Uh, divide 5 into 110 and what do you get? You get 55, right? No. 5 into 110 is what? Um, 5 into 110 is 20, 26, right? No, 22. 22. So 22 multiplied by 9 is what? 22 multip um, times 9 is what? No, no, 20. No, do you, the, no, divide by 9, multiply by, m m divide by 5, multiply by 9, add 32. That's how you do it, to get the Celsius. But that's the other way. Oh, he's doing it. So what was it, 40 what? 43.3 Celsius. Adibo. We're close to that right now, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> So that's the temperature was about 110. I remember Indra Jumna Maharaj was taking one liter of water in a bottle and pouring it over his whole head, just pouring the whole bottle over his head. And his dhoti would be wet, and then about a couple minutes later, he's completely dry again. <laughs> he was doing that regularly. There's one picture. It's me pouring a bottle of water over his head. So it's kind of a funny picture you'll see. I'm going, he's asked me to pour it, so I poured it over his head. <laughs> huh? I love doing that, so it was, he picked the right person. <laughs> so we were doing kirtan, 
And the devotees had made three circles around us, really tight arm-to-arm -arm circles, and big circles too. But people were crashing, trying to crash through our circles and come into the kirtan or do whatever they wanted to do. And the devotees had a hard time. Sometimes they would break the outer circle and come into the... We always had the strongest guys on the inner circle. <laughs> guys like Marco and... Uh, who else? Ananta. <laughs> and... Um, Mother Somadatri, she's strong. <laughs> Don't mess with Soma. <laughs> She's got a lot of power. She keeps it hidden, though. <laughs> well, strength is one of the opulences, right? Strength, beauty, uh, knowledge, renunciation, fame, and what's the other one? Wealth, yeah. All these are the six opulences. Sadaishwarya. And so, yeah, six opulences. So devotees sometimes have one or more of the opulates in an outstanding way. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so when we were trying to do kirtan, it was we were a little bit of concern because, I mean, there's I mean thousands of people were trying to break through, and, but we we kept going somehow, <laughs> kept the kirtan going. So yeah, Lord Caitanya had the same problem. <laughs> He had it before we did. <laughs> and so people would try to crash through the breaking. And, but Kashivara was there and he was big and strong, so he would keep. Another service that he would also do, he would love to serve prasadam to the devotees. So the devotees also had their regulated service. So there were seven main service servers. And their names, uh, Srup Damodar was one of the main service. Who else? I can't remember all of the names of the different devotees who serve regularly the devotees. And serving Lord Chaitanya's devotees wasn't easy because they ate so much. <laughs> That's one of the things about being in Lord Chaitanya's uh, movement. You can eat a lot of prasadam and it looks good. <laughs> So, because our movement is three things. What, what is it? Chanting, dancing, and feasting, and counseling, right? No. no. <laughs> Chanting, dancing, feasting, and what else? Sleeping? No. <laughs> Chanting, dancing, feasting, and philosophy. Someone added that fourth one. That's our movement. If you do those four things... Regularly, you're guaranteed to go back home, back to Godhead, especially chanting and dancing. I like it here because this is one of the few places in the world that the temple president dances. <laughs> well, he actually, you're trying to escape, and it looks like dancing. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm not exaggerating, you know, I, very rarely do I see in any of our temples the temple president taking part in the kirtans and dancing with the devotees. It's just, when I come here, I notice what's this, this. But then I realize it's it's easy here because Panchatattva's here. <laughs> and, and Lord Chaitanya makes everyone dance. <laughs> When he comes with Panchatattva, they all dance. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this is some of the... In his course, he used to be... So he When he would serve, he was so big that when he would grab the prasadam... Lord Chaitanya also had big hands. Lord Chaitanya's hands were huge. And when he would grab a handful of prasadam to serve, it was enough for five people. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya was big. His arms went all the way down to his knees. When he let his arms going down, it went right to his knees when he was standing. He was, And Lord Chaitanya was about two meters tall. 
Almost, he was about two meters tall. So Lord Chaitanya was not a small guy. <laughs> he was big and beautiful at the same time. He looked like a golden mountain. <laughs> He's described in that way. So when you dress him in these beautiful yellowish garments, it really illustrates his his qualities really nice. Gold on gold. <laughs> so this is all I have on Kashivar. There's not so much about him either. Of course, his disappearance day is today in the month of Kartik, like that. So to hear about the glories of the great souls is to actually worship the Lord. Um, the Lord is more pleased when we serve and glorify His devotees. The devotees are more important to the Lord than the Lord is to Himself. So one who serves His devotees becomes very dear to the Lord. And especially when we hear about these great souls, not only do we uh, relish their activities and what they taught us, but we also are nourished by their example in life. They teach us so much through their personal example. Sometimes it's renunciation, sometimes it's devotion, sometimes it's doing amazing things to spread Krishna consciousness. So ISKCON is a branch of Lord Chaitanya's movement. It's mentioned in the uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's the, it's, I think it's called the fifth branch of the, of the Chaitanya tree. The Lord Chaitanya's movement has manifested in this ISKCON movement, which was started by Srila Prabhupada, but actually begun by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, who really was the pioneer for Krishna consciousness in the West. And then, of course, later Bhakti Siddhanta, who really pushed it further, where he sent many people to go to Western countries to spread Krishna consciousness. And because of that, uh, Srila Prabhupada came. Uh, many people went to London, some went to Germany, there's also one account of someone going to France. <coughs> mm -hmm. I always start my recorder at the end of the lecture. <laughs> Say la vie. I don't know why I bring it. I never start it. I guess it looks good. <laughs> I'm glad you guys tape it. It's taped, right? Not today, though. Right? <laughs> but even Ananta forgot to bring his recorder. <laughs> this lecture wasn't meant to be taped. <laughs> oh, you, you record. Uh, it's in, in English. Oh, okay, good, because I need it for my website, just in case somebody gets desperate and I have a lecture. <laughs> so these are, so Lord Chaitanya's devotees are really amazing. That's why we say, um, Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda. And so, Gaur, Bhakti, Srivas, Adi, Gaur, and the rest of Lord Chaitanya. So when you chant the Panchatattva Mantra, you're also glorifying all of the followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who were personally present with him during his time here. So it's actually... And his devotees are mostly <clears throat> Manjaris from the spiritual world who have come to assist him in his pastimes. He brought Lord Nityananda with him. Lord Nityananda's associates are all Gopals, or cowherd boys. So we have two Rasas very prominent, like that. Uh, mostly Manjaris and uh, Sakas. 
in Lord Chaitanya. And of course, there was a few others who had other rasas too. But mainly, these were the two rasas of Lord Chaitanya because Lord Chaitanya is Radharani coming in the form of himself. And therefore, mostly it's all Radharani's assistance in the form of manjaris and gopis. Our movement is manjari bhav. We're not gopi bhav, we're manjari bhav. And that is that the, the manjaris are the assistants <coughs> who make all arrangements for Radha and Krishna. And in other words, they make arrangements for others to uh, get the uh, association of Radha and Krishna Vrindavan. So when you do book distribution, you're in the mood of Manjari Bhav. <laughs> Book distribution is Madhurya Ras. <laughs> because what you're doing is you're bringing souls to Krishna. And that's the job of the manjaris, to bring other souls to Krishna by making arrangements. So by distributing books, you are performing the, the work of the gopis, manjaris like that. Um, okay. Um, anybody would like to hear a particular topic? Uh, I can speak on something. Austerities. Austerities. Okay, so. Austerity is the wealth of the Brahmin class, as mentioned in the scriptures. There are, f there are th four kinds of wealth, maybe five, four. Uh, the lowest form of wealth is money. <laughs> Higher than money is knowledge. Higher than knowledge is austerity. And higher than austerity is bhakti. So bhakti is the wealth of wealth. And just below that is austerity. Because austerity leads to bhakti. Knowledge leads to austerity. That's how it works. The, when you have knowledge, then you understand the importance of performing austerities. And austerities get you off the bodily plant platform. And then they bring you to the consciousness of, of rendering service to the Lord. So that's the progression. So there are austerities of the body, austerities of the mind, and austerities of speech. Austerities of the body are cleanliness, uh, celibacy, hmm, what else? Oh. Worship of superiors, including parents, what else? There's five austerities of the body. Austerities of the mind are simplicity, gravity, satisfaction and austerities of speech which I haven't really mastered yet <laughs> is to tr speak truthfully and beneficially and avoid speech that offends <laughs> so I'm working on that it might take me a few lifetimes but <laughs> so yeah uh, so these are some of the austerities that we... Simplicity means to live according to your needs. Simplicity is, means what you see is what you get. What does that mean? A devotee has nothing to hide. A devotee presents themselves as they are. They're not pretentious. They're not duplicious. They're not presenting themselves one way and having another, what we say, life in, uh, behind the scenes. In other words, they are who they are, as you see them. They are simple and they act in the proper way. Austerities and satisfaction is learn to somehow or other be satisfied whatever Krishna arranges for your daily needs and to be happy to engage in devotional service. People in the material world are not very satisfied. Dissatisfaction makes up the material world. People are always unhappy with what they have and always trying to get more. 
And even though they get more, they still remain unsatisfied. But a devotee can be satisfied with a little. A devotee can be satisfied with a lot. Uh, says Prabhupada says, if you're told to live under a tree, then you can be satisfied with that. And if you're told to live in the palace, you can be satisfied with that. So they don't see any difference in the material arrangements. They accept whatever Krishna arranges and become satisfied. Whether it's opulent or simple, it's whatever is conducive for devotional service like that. So satisfaction, simplicity, like that. These are some of the things. Uh, any questions on austerity? Austerity means to chant 16 rounds every day, minimum, and follow the four regative principles. That's an austerity. You can do it. Those of you who are new in Krishna consciousness, you see, you're thinking, yeah, I'm doing it. But do it for 10 years. Do it for 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, every day, 45. So you'll see, you'll be tested, and Maya will throw her tests at you. So steadiness in both bhakti and in the activities of devotional service uh, is the principle of advancement in Krishna consciousness. So remain steady in chanting 16 rounds and uh, following the four regulative principles. <coughs> um, so that's, uh, yeah, like that. Okay, these are some austerities. Celibacy means for brahmacharis, no contact with women. Sannyasis also, but sannyasis are gurus, so they have to somehow or other, which is not a principle in in shastras to work to have women disciples so sometimes there is some interaction there but generally brahmacharis should not associate with women and if they have to for service only only for carrying on the service and nothing more like that uh, for those in grihastha life celibacy means uh, procreation of children only only for bringing children into the world so they can become devotees like that. <laughs> Celibacy is one of the greatest austerities because even if a materialist remains celibate his whole life, he reaches Brahma Loka. even without performing devotional service. <laughs> like he can reach Brahma Loka. He can go to the spiritual world, though, of course, without devotion. Okay, so would do, anyone would like to comment? Well, the tendency is that it's done as an offering to the Lord in order to increase one's service or to de get us off the bodily platform. So austerity is meant to get you off the bodily platform and to increase your service like that. So, therefore, austerity means to accept some hardship in order to perform devotional service. Like, you know, sometimes it's just difficult because of weather conditions, because of living conditions. So we have to live together in an ashram environment. It's not always easy. The guy next to you snores like, like King Kong the gorilla, you know. <laughs> So you have your earplugs in, but still it doesn't work. You put your headphones on, still it goes through the headphones. <laughs> 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 so.
So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so living in an ashram is not so easy. <laughs> and uh, sometimes you don't like the guy next to you, but still, you're supposed to. <laughs> So yeah, it's just like, what can you do? So, and the temple president says, this is the way it is, don't, don't complain. <laughs> so yeah, so living in an ashram is an austerity, but it has its benefits, obviously. It keeps us living in a very simple atmosphere where we have very little possessions. And the less possessions you have to in terms of your needs, the, the easier it is to focus on devotional service, like that. So there's austerity. Sometimes we have to go out in the cold weather. It's an austerity. Sometimes we have to deal with people who are difficult to deal with, but still we have to do our service. <clears throat> so these are all austerities that we have to face. Sometimes we're thinking, oh boy, I can't wait for prasadam, then it comes and you don't like it. <laughs> and then your whole day is, you're just just, just cursing yourself for, for having such bad luck. <laughs> so, you know, so yeah, there's austerities that we have to somehow deal with. But, I mean, it's, to get out of this material world is not trying to make a nice, comfortable arrangement. Getting out of this material world means performing, accepting some difficult for a higher purpose. And that's the important thing. It's not difficulties for difficult. Some devotees like to perform austerities for the sake of austerity. And um, they enjoy the austerity. But austerity is meant to attach you more to Krishna and to reduce your bodily conception of life. Some people perform great austerities, but they become hard-hearted. And that, that is contrary. If the austerity makes your hard heart, just like on ekadasi, just like you may be fasting on ekadasi and everybody else is taking prasadam and you're thinking, boy, they're all in maya. <laughs> so you, that means uh, you're having, your, maya, your false ego is having a feast, <laughs> so better to take prasadam. <laughs> so yeah, so we have to perform austerities nicely, willingly, and at the same time attach ourselves more to Krishna. And of course, yagnai sankirtanai prayaya janti he's made us. Uh -huh. The greatest austerity is to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Krishna Varnam Tusa Krishna Sangopanga Saparshadam Yagyai Sankirtanai Prayai Yajanti He Sumedasa Yagyai Sankirtai So the Yagya in this age is Harinam Sankirtan. But it's so nice. It's not even an austerity. But me and I think at the beginning when you first started, it was a little awkward. I know some devotees who later became, you know, one of the most enthusiastic kirtan participants when they first joined. They thought this singing and dancing was really strange. And they were they would sit on the side. Mm-hmm like that. We have, the Mayavadis don't sing and dance because they, they think it ruins their dira, you know, sober. So Mayavadi means miserable, you know. <laughs> They're miserable. Yeah, like that. You got it. <laughs> they stay like that for a long time. <laughs> So, but devotees like to sing, they like to dance, they enjoy taking prasadam, and they enjoy sharing all of it with others, just as much as they enjoy doing it themselves. Yes, a devotee. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so these are some austerities like that. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, what am I doing in Ljubljana? <laughs> I'm locked down here. I can't get out. <laughs> I tried to escape twice, and I came. I, I wound up coming back. <laughs> but then I thought, Lord Chaitanya is here. Pretty good. <laughs> the devotees like Kirtan here. It's pretty nice. They can't cook, but that's all right. The sweets are the best. If you guys could make sweets only, it would, it would be the best temple in the, for prasadam. You have the best sweets, but after that, everything is on the other end. So, well, that's okay. It's, it's 50%. <laughs> Your sweets are the are like super, super califragilisticexpialidocious. It's really the best. But I don't eat sweets, so I have to. <laughs> so I have to. I have to perform austerity. <laughs> Fortunately, Mother Somadatri came on her, riding on her swan <laughs> carrier, and came to save me. <laughs> All the way from, what is it, Selyavan, it's called? Selyavan. <laughs> and then I thought, well, I got this apartment, and I don't like it. <laughs> but Krishna put me here, so I, I have to like it. And I'm almost, I'm pretty much, I almost like it now getting better. I think when I fully surrender, then Krishna will say, all right, time to go. <laughs> Everything is so nice here, <laughs> except my mentality. <laughs> Everything is really nice. Prabhupada's here. Prabhupada always looks so regal sitting on his and his Vyasa son. Panchatatva's here. If something breaks, we got Divendra, he can fix anything. Even Krishna calls him when something goes wrong. <laughs> There's nothing he can't fix. <laughs> That's true. We got Marco here who sings like, like, uh, let me think, who does he sing like? His voice is like the rumbling of the demigods when they speak. <laughs> demigods have very deep voices and it's like the rumbling of crowds when he sings. It's like one of the principal demigods has descended in the form of kirtan. Gadadhar is learning uh, harmonium and tonight he really played his best ever. <laughs> And Danilo, he's just so nice to be around. He doesn't, he doesn't have to do anything. He's just <laughs> Jagannath Sutta. He's just some beautiful Gandharva that and descended just to give everybody an opportunity to see what a Gandharva looks like. <laughs> And there's a few others that I could comment on too. <laughs> yeah. Bhaktivasal Nitai, he's he loves to serve. In fact, if you told him not to serve, he would cry. <laughs> he likes to serve so much that he dreams about serving when he sleeps. <laughs> He has such a wonderful service attitude like that. So the devotees here have so many good qualities. And 
in Ananta. He doesn't fit into any category of temple president. <laughs> don't tell him. To, don't tell the congregation that. Though. <laughs> <laughs> he loves to sing, he loves to dance, he loves to take pictures. <laughs> he loves to send me messages on my on my phone. <laughs> he loves to ask me to give class every day, every minute. <laughs> I think it wasn't for Ananta, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> and of course, there's so many other wonderful devotees here. When I see you, I remember your good qualities. <laughs> Mother Somadatri, I don't have time to list all your good qualities. It would just be... I'd be be here to, to, to Mongol Archie to, tomorrow morning still speaking. <laughs> to, for the first time since she's been serving me, she did something wrong today. Oh. 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 Yeah. Well, she did it on purpose. <laughs> Because she knows I eat too much, so she, so she decided to make one thing not so nice, so I wouldn't eat so much. <laughs> really, it's Krishna whispered, "Hey, burn the chapatis, <laughs> and don't cook them at the same time." <laughs> So when I was looking at the chapatis, I was seeing, hmm, what demon is this? <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> but it was purposely done so I would eat less. <laughs> so really she didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> So, yeah, there's so many wonderful Vaishnavas here. And what's his name? Uh, Mishra. He dances like nobody else dances in the world. <laughs> I can't describe it, but you have to see it. <laughs> and he's always, uh, always in a good mood. He always likes to make sure that my microphone is place firmly within my mouth. <laughs> Not close to it, but I should be eating the microphone. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Because it's good. It's good you have you're supposed to have some metal in your diet, right? <laughs> So he's always making sure I get nourished. <laughs> so everybody's my well-wisher here. <laughs> I wish he would stay in the well. That's <laughs> so yeah, I don't know your name, but you're the most humblest person I've met here. <laughs> He's so humble and sweet, and he's just like, he's a sweetheart. <laughs> His humility kind of like makes me look like, you know, like Hirani Kashipu. <laughs> and there's people who don't talk to me, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> Because <laughs> they know I don't like to talk so much, so that they they maintain that from profile. I don't talk to him because he doesn't like to talk. <laughs> 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 uh, 
And the Bengalis here, oh, they're so nice. Premananda when he cooks. I want to go to Bengala next day after he cooks. <laughs> he cooks so nice. He does. He was. He made me the other the other day. He made me two vegetables when Somadatri escaped and went to Siliavan. And he made two vegetables. So I was complimenting him on the vegetables, saying how nice they were. So the next day, which is the codice, he makes me this vegetable pie. <laughs> and I didn't want it. I said, what is this? I said, I don't need these things on a codice. But he just gave it to me, and I wound up eating the whole thing. <laughs> it was so good. He, whatever he touches turns into, and then who's that Murdunga? Is that Sachi Kumar? He plays in Murdunga? The one I was playing tonight? Huh? Narayan Charan, yeah. Yeah, he, he's a real great Madunga player. He always smiles when he sees me. <laughs> because, you know, because... So yeah, when I see the Bengalis, I feel at home. <laughs> I really love Bengal. I was talking to a devotee who used to be here, who's now in Mayapur. His name is Nishringatirtha. He's my disciple. He was telling me, uh, Mayapur's opening up now. <laughs> All they, they're not, pilgrims are coming, <clears throat> and programs are going on in the temple. There's still some restrictions, but pretty much everything is coming back to normal in Mayapur. So that's good. At least, almost, there's still, you know, still some caution in different things, but still. So Mayapur is open. It means that India in general is, is I think, is just relaxing some of its restrictions. Whereas Slovenia is getting tighter. The police hours is going to be changed tomorrow. It's going to start at 9 a.m. and end at 12 noon. So you have three hours to go out from 9 a.m. to 12. After that, you're arrested. <laughs> They're working on it. <laughs> Slovenia is thinking we have to be more stricter than Hitler. <laughs> we have to make it so strict that it will charge everyone for breathing more than required. <laughs> if you breathe too much, you're going to be fined for polluting the environment with COVID. <laughs> So, yeah, Slovenia means, what? Well, yeah. I just, when I walk outside, I don't see anybody. It's like they all died. <laughs> the only time I see people is when I come to the temple. <laughs> Once in a while I see a dog on a leash, but that's about it. <laughs> So it's, uh, yeah, uh, after how many months I've been here? July, August, September, October, November, five months. I'm almost here. I haven't quite made it here yet, but I'm still working on it. <laughs> so if you can tolerate me, and that's, that's, that's another austerity we didn't talk about. Tolerating the guru. <laughs> that reminds me of Deva Amrita Swami. He gave a lecture. It was called Hi Maharaj, Bye Maharaj. <laughs> it's the title of a lecture, yeah, and I actually have the lecture. <laughs> it's like when the Swamis come, you say, Wow, it's so nice they came. But don't stay too long. Because <laughs> then things don't go back to the way we want them. <laughs> so, 
you look so sad. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. So life in the material world doesn't make sense. <laughs> Materialists work so hard just to lose it all. <laughs> Devotees work so hard just to lose it all but gain eternal life. That's the difference. So we're going to, whatever we do here is, is uh, actually uh, registering as our future in eternal life. So anything a materialist does comes and then it stays for some time, then it goes. But devotees may also do activities that look similar to the materialist. But those activities actually are not, and they bring you to the lotus feet of the Lord in devotion, and they are your ticket back to the spiritual world. So, life is a waste of time, other than spiritual life. So whatever materialists they do, they just waste their time, valuable time, and they can't enjoy what they have. They're always in, hankering for more, lamenting for what they lose, hankering for what they don't have, and at the end, you die. <laughs> it's, I remember I went to, uh, I was in a place called Hollywood, which is the movie capital of America. You've heard of Hollywood? Yeah. So there was one... Do huh? Yeah, we could say that. New York's got it beat up. <laughs> Papa said, New York is 50 years ahead in Kali Yuga. <laughs> <laughs> It's called the city that never sleeps. 24 hours a day, it goes. Bars, nightclubs, discotheques, movie theaters, around the clock. No, nothing, nothing stops. And you can go and you can go out at two o'clock in the morning, and the streets are crowded and cars are going. Yeah. That's New York, at least before COVID, anyway. <laughs> But I was in Hollywood, <clears throat> and then there was one devotee who was a good friend, and he had another. He had met one person who was a, an author, and who lived in Hollywood and had many friends who were in the movie business. So, he asked me if I could do a program with them. I mean, these were people who were filthy rich, you know. Their bathrooms are the size of this temple here. <laughs> so, you know, they have so much. So I thought, all right, what am I going to say to these people? <laughs> so I went. And then I'm thinking, hmm. and there was a mixture of ladies and men, different ages, young, old. And then later on, of course, I met them all and we talked, but I gave my lecture. I decided, what am I going to speak about? So then I remembered there was this one story, which is like a little, you know, it has a message. And so I told the story, and that was my lecture. <laughs> Would you like to hear the story? They have to remember I'm speaking to people whose whole life centers around fame, wealth, and so many of the, you know, what they call the, the highlight of life. So I decided, all right, I'm going to tell this story. <laughs> They're either going to walk out on me or throw me out, but I'm going to tell the story anyway. I just said, might as well go for it. <laughs> so I told the story, and I spoke a little bit in brief to begin, and then I said, well, there's, there's this story about this rich merchant and um, in India, we know people, sometimes they have more than one wife. So this rich merchant, he was a greedy merchant, rich, greedy merchant, and he had four wives. Four. Four, four wives. 
His fourth wife was his favorite wife. His third wife was also a favorite, but not as popular as the fourth wife. The second wife was okay, but the first wife he neglected. So, um, so now he has these four wives, and then one day he comes back from the doctors, and the doctor says, my dear sir, you have a terminal disease. You will be dying soon. There's no cure. So now he's in anxiety. He's a rich merchant. He has a lot of wealth, four wives. So he's thinking, hmm. So he goes to his fourth wife, his favorite wife, and he says, my dear wife, when I go, will you come with me? She said, it's nice knowing you, Haribo, that's it, <laughs> we're through. <laughs> so then he said, all right, I'll go to my third wife. So he goes to the third wife, remember I'm telling this story to these rich people, and uh, he says, he tells him the story that he's leaving, will you come with me? She says, well, when you die, I'm going to get remarried. <laughs> so that's it. <laughs> so now he's thinking, all right, I go to the second wife. So he goes to his second wife, and he tells her the story and asks her, please, will you come with me? She says, well, I'll go to the grave and see you off, but that's as far as I go. <laughs> And then the first wife, who we never talked to, neglected, didn't really pay attention to her and all. She's the only one left. So he goes to her. He's feeling kind of embarrassed, realizing he was quite neglectful of her. He tells her the situation, asks her, what she come with me? And she responds, I will never leave you. Mm. So that's the story. <laughs> so who are the four wives? The fourth wife is the body. So when we, at some point, when we go, that's the end of this body. We, we break our relationships with the body. The third wife is our, our, our money, our possessions. So when we die, someone else gets it. Remarriage. The second wife is our friends and relatives. They go to the grave and see us off. <laughs> and the first wife is Krishna. So I told that story. <laughs> Pretty heavy for uh, those type of people. And you know, they all listened attentively. And later on, later on said, they said that they appreciated that story. And then I got to know them. And I found that many of them had so many personal problems. And they wanted to tell me about their problems. And they said, we sat and I was listening to some of the hardships that they had. Although they had so much money. And some of them were quite famous. At least famous in some respects. But their lives were falling apart. So they were seeking some spiritual guidance. That's why they came to the program that night. So uh, it turned out to be a very successful program. I don't know what happened after that. The person who arranged the program, whose house we were at, was, uh, was their acquaintance. and So he had a personal experience where he died. No, yeah, he died, but he he didn't die. He died, but he didn't die. It's called near-death experience. You've you've heard of that, where people actually die, and then they go into this state of existence where they see. Uh, sometimes they see very horrible people, who come and they're dressed in black robes and they take them away. 
and sometimes they see other things. Women who, who sometimes have difficult pregnancies, they, they go through this. They die, almost die at pregnancy and actually die, but then they come back like that. So near-death experiences means that Krishna arranges for somehow you can see your future and then he throws you back in your present situation. Now you know what your future is. Get it together. It's kind of a, it's kind of a form of mercy. And there's many, many people who have near-death experiences, especially women during childbirth and like that. So, and I've met, I met, I met one author. She had three near-death experiences. She was telling me about it, and then she took it up as a as a service. She went around interviewing people, and she said that. She was telling me about the experiences they had after their near-death experiences. Many of them couldn't function. They couldn't live their life the way they were. And at the same time, they didn't know how to live their life. They knew their life was a waste, and they could see their future, but at the same time, they had no alternative. So a lot of them became even worse than they were before. And sometimes a few of them went to, she said, took up some kind of religious or spiritual life. She wrote this whole book, just uh, listing all of these different people who had these different experiences and how their li lives changed or didn't change. And most people had a hard time living it after that experience. Because only the ones that took up spiritual life did they actually make their life. And that was, I guess, Krishna's uh, mercy to get people to see. Because the Yamadudas are real. They're not just some nice you know, cartoon characters in the Bhagavatam. They are real, <laughs> real persons. And they are ugly. Ugly. Man, you is ugly. <laughs> your mother dresses you funny and you're ugly no. <laughs> that's what we used to say when we were kids but so anyway <laughs> so I mean I, there's one devotee he just left his body about two weeks ago maybe you know him from Croatia, Split, Sarananda, what's his name? Hmm? Sunanda, yeah. He was in the hospital, and he was with other people in the hospital. And the devotees would come to visit. And he was telling how people in the hospital, who was in, when they were dying, they were really freaking out. I mean, really just like seeing something horrible. And then they would die. They were seeing the Amadutas. Mm. So these guys are real for the materialists. For the devotees, they don't touch the devotees because Yamaraj has ordered them not to, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> I mean, well, I wonder what it takes to become a Yamaduta. That's a nice service. <laughs> You have to be mean and ugly at the same time a nice guy. <laughs> That's a real hard position to get. <laughs> Anybody want to become a Yamadutta? <laughs> Sometimes we meet people like that. <laughs> so yeah, they are real. So when the materialists die, I met one person, yeah, and, and uh, he he said when I died, I went through this deep dark tunnel. It was just dark, and then I saw these beings, and I got so frightened. And then somehow I I came back to my body right after that. So sometimes people actually go a distance, and then they come back. Their time wasn't up like that because it says when someone dies you should have kirtan immediately especially because the soul sometimes wants to get back into that same body 
people don't like to die, but when they die, sometimes they stay around the body and look for opportunities to enter back into that body again. So it's important that this, the devotee should follow this, that when someone dies, kirtan should be, and that pushes the soul onward towards, you know, towards the spiritual realm. It's very important to do that. Mm -hmm. And we have examples of devotees who were, who died and hung around their body also. There was many experiences like that. So you have to have that kirtan. That's, that's part of the process of bringing people back to the spiritual world. But then there's th those who actually want to leave and go. They already fixed themselves on Krishna and they're like that, and they'll automatically go back. <laughs> but death is nothing, death is a part of life. As long as you have a body, you have to leave it, and that's called death, but the soul doesn't die, the soul is eternal. And therefore, just like you travel from one place to another, that's why sannyas life is good because it does it detaches you from every place. You go from one place to another to another. And that's what sannyas means to travel from place to place, never making any one place your home. And that way, when you die, you, you get the last travel ticket. <laughs> Hopefully, and then you have to travel some other place. So traveling actually is good because it helps you to detach yourself from everything. <laughs> if you're traveling and preaching, that is. Yeah, okay, so I don't want to stay too late, but I did. <laughs> it was all due to Mother Somadatri's cooking today. <laughs> She's a great cook. And and she's you know she's really intelligent too. Did you know that? <laughs> Cuz she always brings my prasadam just at the time I'm ready to take. She's never late or never early. <laughs> right at the right at the time I'm ready. She's there. It's amazing. But should I tell you the secret? She listens to my class and she knows when it's over. So then she comes. <laughs> so that's the reason why she listens to my class. <laughs> so she could be on time for Prashad. <laughs> They say, you know, the the motivation doesn't matter. It's the results that count. <laughs> At least in material life, it's like that. <laughs> all right, so I should let you go because all of you are nice people. <laughs> so I have to stop my class. Sila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Kashivara Pandit Ki, Jai Bugarbas Goswami Ki, Lubyana Temple Ki.